Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Jeff Stern of Stern Tanning Co. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, this episode was recommended by Mr. Bill Ryder, who's a fan of the show, who sent in your info and was just telling me, you know, hey, you should do an episode on tanning. So um, Jeff is, I'll say it up front, not a drummer, but he um, obviously has a lot of skill in um, tanning and making these, you know, natural animal skin drum heads, which we're going to learn all about today. Um, So let's maybe start with, as a non-drummer, how did you get into making drum heads? Well, so my background is that I'm a CPA and um, I started practicing in like 81. And then in 1990, I was bored with it. I worked for a national firm and I approached my dad who had, was a semi-retired, still had a tannery working part-time in Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin. And uh, I had worked there during the summer it's when I was a kid and thought I would, uh, I thought maybe we could get it going again, the, the, the big old tannery. So I approached him and, and he was all excited and he was, I think, like 75 or something when mm. I approached him. And uh, so then we started up and we started building up the sheepskin business. And um, in 2001, uh, I got a call from Mr. Polanski, who was the owner of United Rawhide, saying, telling me that he was deciding to, uh, he was either going to sell his business or sell his real estate separately or try to do, or, se- or do both. And I said, well, you know, wh- whatever you decide, just let me know. And then later on, he called me and said, you know, I've decided I'm going to sell the real estate because it's worth a lot. And um, I have some sheepskin equipment here. I know you're a sheepskin tannery. So, and at that time, I was buying up sheepskin equipment all over the country, you know, because I never knew for sure what we'd be doing next. And I, I thought I would just keep accumulating some uh, used equipment. And, and I usually found a spot for it in, the, in my factory. And then, um, and then, like a couple minutes later, you know, we set something up and I went down to look at the equipment. And and then we got to talking and things had fallen through for his other plans for parsing out the business. So he said, you want to buy the business? And I thought, well, you know, it, it'll fit in. I don't have to do a lot to move it into my factory since we already have all the water and all these, you know, that type of stuff that you need to, to run a tannery yeah. and handle hides. So, you know, that's how it started. And, um, we, we got to talking and I went down to see his place and I bought, the sheepskin equipment and then it went further and then I ended up buying his little business which had already he had already sold off little parts of it and cutting dies and things like that to other customers but the the core of it which wasn't I didn't need much I took a fleshing machine and an unhearing machine from him and uh you know and then we then we got started wow so I want to interject here a little bit and we like Jeff and I talked about this before I'm going to read now um a little bit more uh, from from Rebeats.com, which is Rob Cook, the Chicago Drum Show, great author, just every, you know, great friend of the show. He and I talk regularly um, about the United Rawhide Company of Chicago, because Rob, it's actually there's not a ton of info online, but Rob has a great blurb on his website about um, this classic drum company, which was the United Rawhide Company of Chicago. So so let me read this, and then maybe we'll talk about your relationship with him and your acquiring of that and getting into the drum heads. Um, so uh, to quote Rob Cook from Rebeats.com, the last tannery to produce heads for the major American drum companies was the United Rawhide Company of Chicago, operated by Mr. Stephen Polanski. Polanski, a Czech immigrant, founded United Rawhide in 1951, as the American drum companies gave up their tanning operations in favor of Mylar heads and purchasing finished skins, United Rawhide became the calfskin supplier to nearly all of the major players such as Gretsch, Ludwig, Slingerland, and Rogers. Uh, so that Mylar head thing, as people listening to the show would know, was probably like 56, 57. Um, but I think, you know, you could still get calfskin heads for for a while there. So, uh, so the big four, Gretsch, Ludwig, Slingerland, and Rogers were doing it. Eventually, Mr. Polanski became the only American producer of heads for orchestral drum outfits and timpani, uh, outfits meaning 
you know, drum sets. Uh, when he retired, he sold his business to Stern Tanning and trained Stern and his manufacturing process, which is obviously Jeff, who we're talking to right now. Stern produces skins mounted on wooden flesh hoops as well as unmounted skins. They produce snare drum heads, white or translucent, bass drum heads, timpani heads, tambourine heads, bongo and conga heads, taiko drum heads, and that's that's basically it for what Rob has on his website. So does that all sound uh, correct to you, Jeff? Yeah, uh, Mr. Polanski's business was a little, it was, um, he did a little bit more than that. The And that was the, uh, when we started out, we were really busy doing goatskin vellum for high-end furniture, um, for decorative and, you know, like armor doors, tabletops. So that was really a, 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 an important part of his business um, in terms of the volume. So that that's what we started out doing the most of was the goatskin parchment. And then, you know, then we started providing uh, tambourine. We were doing more tambourine heads than Mr. Plansky was doing for a while. Interesting. Uh, with the goatskin also. Can you, um, can you explain, because I've actually heard it come up in multiple other episodes, what is vellum? And like, when you say parchment, like, are you talking about like, you know, like paper? It's paper thin, basically? Or like, what is well, the vellum? Yeah, vellum and part, it's basically interchangeable. So um, it's just the you know the process skin of the the hide. So there's I don't think there's I've been I've looked into it. And I don't think that there's really anything significantly different between the two terms vellum or parchment. Hmm. So it's just super super thin. And I mean when I think parchment, I think like writing on it. So like are you writing on these super thin goat skin you know parchments I mean, vellum? No, I mean we do sell to some people that do calligraphy and. Uh, but really the thickness of that can be the same thickness as that we sell for our, uh, concert snare or tambourine heads gotcha. or you know, banjo heads. Gotcha. Okay. So is then a drum head made, is that a vellum? Like, is that cause it's so thin? Yeah. I mean, they all, the, I don't know that the thickness really, you know, differentiates between vellum versus rawhide okay i think the vellum is a little more processed got it in a cleaner um more precise kind of uh uh than what you then when when someone thinks of rawhide you know yeah. It's, it's a yeah and and rawhide by nature it just sounds um it sounds more raw <laughs> yeah <laughs> obviously right Um, and, and that's just one of many, uh, we'll call them for me, stupid questions. Cause I know absolutely nothing about this process. Um, so, um, all right. So that's cool. So you, you said you were making tambourine heads and all this stuff. Um, now, uh, obviously for going back a little bit for Mr. Polanski, um, that must've been, I, I mean, I'm just, I don't, you, there's no way you can really know this unless he actually told you, but if he started United Rawhide in 1951, then once Mylar synthetic drum heads came in, he must have kind of just thought to himself, uh, uh-oh, there goes my 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 drum head portion of the business is is in trouble, right? Yeah, well, I'm sure that's the case. I mean, he had, you know, uh, lots of uh, drum frames that were set up to do, uh, you know, to, so he could make the pre-mounted heads, pre-tucked heads. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm sure at the time when he was at the end, he was just doing, you know, onesie twosie type orders as, you know, a lot of it is what we do. Gotcha. So, yeah, I'm sure that was the case. And I, and then the same thing happened to me in our sheepskin tanning business. So, you know, when I started it up with my father, you know, we started, we built it up to the point where we were doing about 3000 skins a week. And then, um, the Chinese industry got involved and, and pretty much, stopped all you know paint roller production of lambskin in the u.s hmm. so all the companies that we were selling to you know so it was that same kind of thing that he experienced that i experienced with lambskin paint rollers oh man well it it happens in every industry i mean there's so many parallels to drumming where like we always talk about on the show we're like silent movies and then the drummers lost a bunch of jobs who were working in theaters or Oh no, here comes drum machines. Now drummers lose their jobs. I think there's the the ups and downs of any industry. Um so all right, well maybe we can talk about now uh a little bit more about the process of how this works and and again, you you live and breathe this stuff. 
I do not. I've I've got a calfskin head that's on an old, I believe, 20s or 30s leady bass drum kind of here behind me. Um, but I know nothing about it. Right. So so when I started, um, Mr. Polanski was older at the time. And so I didn't ha- I wasn't able to get a lot of details about the process. I, I got he wrote some notes and we tried them um, and we had to kind of fine tune things over the years to figure it out how to make a, a a nicer product i don't i think a lot of it was um there weren't like strict formulas that I, he gave me because everything was just kind of in his head so we had to come up with kind of formulas that we we could use so and then i had to figure out the hardest part was the supply of skins had changed from when he was operating years ago when they were big to what i could get now um the the distribution of the raw skin market, it's based on volume. Um, things are, it's harder for, you know, small guys just to get, go, go somewhere and pick hides anymore. Like in the days of the Chicago stockyards, the drum companies that were making heads would go down there and pick up, just could pick out hides. Yeah. But those days are gone now. It's, you know, it's, you have to buy quantity, you know, larger than you may need. And you have to rely on the sort that you're getting. And so it's, I had to figure out sources that would work for what we needed. So that took a while until I kind of narrowed that down. And that's changing all the time. I mean, the supply that I may have out of California, for instance, for small calf, um, that, that dried up. So I had to go somewhere else. And so it's always been an ongoing struggle with that. Um, and the same thing with goat skin too, you know, as the, as the packing houses get busier and busier, the quality of the takeoff, of the hide uh, became an issue because there'd be butcher scores and marks and holes. So I had to really, you know, try to get people to do sort that I need um, if they were willing to do that. Cause we're a small user. So you know, it's not like anyone's knocking on our door to sell us skins. Yeah. So it was just a relationship. So they helped me get what I would need both in goat and calf. And I would do it, you know, I would, I was getting selections, in everything, the big the big steer for Tyco and Latin percussion, and 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 so that's kind of how we. It took years to kind of develop that, um, and to figure out then, okay, I'm getting bigger calf skins than Mr. Plansky got. How do I make that work for what we need? And uh, so I had to figure out different processes to thin the leather uniformly, and you know, make it so that it could be working for the you know, for what we needed for an end product. Yeah. So I ended up. Uh, so what we get from the from various collectors are what I try to get are sorted, pre-sorted hides, both goat and calf and steer, uh, that work for what we need. And they, most everything comes in salt cured. So it's what not is, a, What does that mean? Salt cured. So the pack the packing houses after they do the the run the butchering operation, you know, it's the hide business has become a it's a big byproduct for them. So, you know, they, they get I'll make a lot of money on hides in good markets, for instance. And they have so they have an operation where they, they'll lay the hides out and some some are established enough that they actually pre flesh them on a machine. And if not, they just lay them out flat and put salt on them and, and you know, pile them up and and then they get palletized and go to places like me or other big tanneries. Hmm. Does it draw them like I guess curing, I mean, is it drawing the moisture out? Inside yeah, of it. Salt, salt will draw the moisture out of the hide and um, cure it so that the uh, if it wasn't salt, that you know it would just areas would rot. You know, yeah, you know, bad areas of the grain and things like that. That makes sense. So carry on there. So you you get them, you know, salt cured, and then what happens after that? So then then we bring them in and we you know we rehydrate them, um, and then we do an old process. And this is Mr. Polanski showed me this and I've, I've modified it a little bit um, since doing other things. I've kind of learned some things, but um, it's a very gentle process to, you know, so we'll soak them uh, when they come in, the, once they come in the door and then we'll flesh them. They need to be fleshed clean in the raw condition so that the unhairing works properly. And then from the fleshing operation, we go into an unhairing, which is the old, which is a very gentle process the way we do it. So we'll have it, in lime and uh, another chemicals for you know four or five days hmm. letting it just very gently on hair and we don't it doesn't knock the hair out we actually just 
it just loosens the the follicle. Interesting. And then we have yeah, and we have an unhairing machine then where, that I got from Mr. Polanski, and uh, where you run it on there and it knocks it pull it pulls you try to pull the hair off uh, with the machine, and then we also do hand scudding, which is really you know labor intensive. So we'll scud the hair side also to you know clean out the follicles and hmm. push any oils and grease out that we can. So that's a real labor intensive, and that you know that has it's tough to do, and it's tough to find people willing to do that. You know? Yeah, I mean, there, yeah, that's an old old operation that people have, you know, scudding blades in their hand and and uh, working over, you know, round rounded barrel type things. And so laying the skin out. The scudding, then, what is that actually? Because the the unhairing, so to. Because at first I was like, unhairing, what's that mean? And then I was like, oh, to unhair, to take the yeah, hair yeah, out. Take the hair. Yeah. So so what is the scudding actually doing? Is that removing even, you said it's removing even further and getting those things, those like, you know, oils and all this stuff. So what happens if you don't do that? Does it just, you know? Well, then you end up with, you'll end up with a vellum or rawhide that has, like, let's say it's a black and white Holstein. You'll see the black and white, the black hair follicle in the hide mm. and um you know so we actually for our concert base and now that we've developed the process for timpani we scud those real carefully to try to make them you know the appearance really nice yeah yeah so just the nice appearance meaning it's just one solid like white or translucent just like a nice clean yeah yeah so it'll it'll take the black follicles out so it's a, it's a cleaner look. Do you ever do it where you leave some of those multi, like the color, like the actual, like, cause sometimes people like that, like your front bass drum head or something. Um, I think DJ Fontana, I believe with Elvis, yeah. he, yes. had, I think he had a furry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll do some hair on a uh, calf. We don't do a lot of it. We were selling it to a, a, a company um, for uh, that primarily uh, sells in African drumming. So for that customer, we were doing hair on large calf. Um, and that can also, and then I'll, once in a while, I'll get orders for hair on bass drums. We don't do a lot of it and I'm trying to, it, it gets harder to, you know, to do things and then, uh, just for small, real small orders. Yeah. And also the, the, what the pressure we have is the, the price of the, these skins, the large skins, for instance, that I was selling to the African drumming or use for concert bass or timpani, or also that I use them for in the um, drum kit because they're thicker. Mm -hmm. um, they're very expensive skins. Sure. They're like the top price per foot raw skin. Most of it goes to Italy for high end uh, garment leather. Wow. So, and the supply in the States is pretty low of that. There's not a great supply. So the price never really comes down, even in slow markets so there's a lot of pressure for me to do hair on hides hmm. and there's um you know the, the african drumming market is a little bit tighter in terms of pricing so it, you know it, it sometimes it's tough for us to take a take a nice big skin and really make anything when we have to sell them at tighter prices just to compete with the african drumming pricing yeah interesting Okay, so um, then back in the process, so we were, the hair is off, we were scudding. Uh, yeah, then it, then it goes into a, like a lime solution that's in there for days. Hmm. Um, or, you know, that's after, the scudding is right after that and the unhearing. And then we go into the deliming where we have to basically get it back to its natural state. So we do that chemically and with water and lots of washing. So we go through a lot of water here. Sure. And, um, and then depending on what I'm doing, if I'm making translucent or white, the, the process changes a little bit at that point. But, um, and then it's, then after it comes out of the water again, we flesh it a few more times. So there's a lot of fleshing going on cause you want a real clean, you know, backside, the flesh side, um, and uh, a lot of washing. Hmm. So fleshing, how does that, uh, you may have already explained it, but what, what is that fleshing so the, we, we we use machine to do that, and in the old days they would do it by hand, and that's actually cleaning the flesh side of the skin. You know, the the one side is the grain side, 
that's where the hair is. And then the other side is the flesh side of the, of the skin. Hmm. So that has to be pristinely clean for the unhairing to work and for it to be a nice peach, piece of uh, vellum. Gotcha. So what a drummer actually plays facing up or a bass drum facing towards them is the internal, the inside of the animal's uh, flesh, correct? No, no. They're, generally, they're playing on the grain side. Got it. Because then you get a yeah. little bit for brushes or whatever, you get a little bit of uh, texture, right? Well, the grain side is, is generally smoother than the flesh side. But if you, I mean, if you play brushes, for instance, on the flesh side, it would really nap up. You can, you, the flesh side is the suede side, I like see. of a piece of leather. Yeah. Yeah. So it, that would really nap up and be problematic. So the grain side is the side they play on if they're playing brushes. Okay. Or, for, or most, I mean, there are some, uh, an orchestral that will play on a really finely sand flesh side. But for the most part, what we're doing, everything is, and even our orchestral is everything is on the grain side. Gotcha. So you're hitting, you're hitting a side where the hair was. Okay. Interesting. All right. So, so then, uh, how do we get from, so we, we have, uh, it's been defleshed. It's been, uh, it's in the lime. It's all that stuff. Where do we go from there to get closer to putting this thing on a on a drum? Yeah. So then, after the all the washing and finish fleshing operations are done, you know, then then you tack out the hide, and we do that in old fashioned way with boards and nails, you know, the way Mister Polanski did it. And you know, so there's stretching going on, and, and it's usually a two man operation. And uh, you know, so we let it dry for a couple of days. And, and at that point, then the guys do the untacking and then I get involved in doing the sorting and grading, um, figuring out, you know, what's, what skin is good for what, and what area of the skin. And yeah. So I'm, I'm there with a long neck micrometer checking. Huh. And then I do, and then I, I lay out the hide, um, and do the cutting and take the various heads out that I can for, for what I know what works. and um, and then I do finish sanding on a machine that I got from Mr. Polanski. And, um, and that's just the old, you know, kind of, you have to be really anal about it. And, yeah. And I'm, I'm there with a micrometer checking a hide as I go through it. I think, I think I'm, I maybe do it more than was done when they were mass producing these. Cause I've seen old heads come in and they're, you know, not entirely uniform. Yeah. But I, I think what happened is when I started out, um, you know, I wanted to get a uh, real, make a really nice head for the orchestral market. So there's a timpanist in the, at the Cleveland Orchestra, Tom Freer, who was kind of my sounding board and also the guy who would, I would send samples to and find out what he thought. And he would kind of tell me what he liked. Um, and he was, he's pretty particular. So I tend to really try to sand things to, so they're really uniform. Sure. Um, you know, within a thousandths or so of, if let's say our concert orchestral head is eight thousandths thick, I'm right in that seven and a half to eight and a half range. Wow. On all the heads that we sand. I mean, and, I, and I, I'm doing the sanding. I like that you're, you're doing a very specialized thing where you can just kind of feel it and use your tools and all this stuff. And, and I guess the end product that comes out uses your masterful eye and senses to make sure that the quality is key because I know with a lot of typically with a lot of people who are buying these, it's not like, um, hey, my son has just bought his first drum set. Let's get him a full set of goatskin heads for his little pearl export hunt two hundred dollar drum set. It's like, no, this is for very passionate, skilled drummers, typically, right? Yeah, right. I mean, with the, at the price point of the drum heads, it's it's not something that beginners use. No. I mean, you may get young, you know, orchestral students, sure that want to start out with that and do their, you know, either auditions or get ready for grad school and have calf to play on. Um, Cause maybe their professor tells them that you know, they should get some calf or, or try it. So we get that. And the, and the, our other market is probably in, um, and that was a little bit new for me, the, like the drum kit drumming. I mean, we've been doing it for years, but I've got a better feel for the thicknesses that people like. And, you know, when I, a good customer, you know, was a Stan at Pro Drum, 
And, um, you know, I was, at the beginning when I started out with Stan, he was, no, no, this is too thin, right? Because I was kind of geared into the orchestral market, and I would send Stan then really nice heads that I thought were nice, and he said, no, no, we want, we want, we want something a little more meat on it. We mm-hmm. want to, we want to hear some of that jungle sound a little more, you know, warm. Hmm. So he kind of pushed me into making a thicker, uh, calfskin head for the, for a uh, drum kit playing. And, you know, with, with, in that market, you know, they're, they're playing and there's a lot of session players and being able to mic things, um, so they can get the sound out of it. But so I've got a whole range of, you know, thicknesses that I know that generally I do for orchestral, jazz, uh, drum kit. Some guys, you know, will make specific requests about how thick they like it. Hmm. So I have all the ranges that I work in, and I've kind of got a good handle in terms of, you know, what everything is in terms of concert bass and field, you know, drum and fife core and sure. and uh, drum kit. So I've, that's just something I've kind of learned over the years. Yeah, a lot of feel, a lot of knowledge, a lot of built, uh, uh, a lot of experience gained. Um, now I want to ask you too. So, so in that blurb I read from Rob Cook's website before. It mentioned that you can either buy them, you know, finished on a hoop drum heads, or you can buy them as as kind of untucked. Can we um, maybe hop over and talk about that? That I guess that would be kind of the the final step there of of, of putting it on a flesh hoop and right. getting it sent out. I don't really know much about that. Um, can you kind of just like even down to what do you guys make the hoop? All this stuff, how the process of tucking works. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Okay. So the flesh hoop, the wooden flesh hoops we do not make. We buy those. I buy those unglued and unsanded. So what I do then is, uh, depending on what size I need to make, I use the drum space. Uh, you know, I lay out the drum, I lay out, and I get spacers and C-clamps. And I, you know, put the w- wood flesh hoop it's, you know, it's on it and bend it around. And it's bent when we get it. It's just not glued tight. Then I, I'll i mark it after it's all set up on the drum with C-clamps and spacers. Uh, mark it, and then I glue it. Um, and then we do sanding to clean it up after the glue dries, and, um, and then it's good, ready to go. Steel hoops uh, we make mostly in-house, but we only make them for really in the past 13- and 14-inch uh, drum heads, and that's mostly for their uh, orchestral market. Uh, they all want steel hoops on theirs. Um, why, is, why would they prefer steel? Well, wood hoops over time can flex in as you're tensioning it. So the steel is never going to, you know, the, you'll never get any warping or flexing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's the, the difference. I, it, um, it's more expensive uh, to yeah. do the steel. Sure. Um, but, uh, you know, the drum kit stuff is... A lot of what we do is the vintage, and that's, you know, mostly old. That was all wood back in the day. Um, so, and we're not set up to make steel for all the other sizes. So, gotcha. We're kind of, you know, we're kind of doing wood for all the con- and for the concert bass drum, and you know, because we make everything from like ten inch or eight inch to forty inch. Wow. Uh, finished heads. So then, um, obviously, let's kind of cover maybe the. Um, the actual process of doing the because because calf skin like tucking and I guess it there would be on on old old drums there'd be tack you'd tack it onto the drum so I'm assuming uh, and I want to talk about the the tucking but like I'm assuming if someone was going to do the tack heads on their own personal like you know 1920s or whatever drum set they would order the head not with a hoop is that correct right yeah yeah so there's people that a lot of People order cut rounds only, and they either like to do the tucking themselves, or they're you know they're drum and fife core guys, and they do all the tucking hmm. on their own. So um, yeah, so then we you know I'll re- rehydrate the the sanded head when it's finished, and the drum hoop is ready to go, and then um, I do the tucking. We did a um, years ago for Drum Magazine, we did a like a twenty two step pictorial step by step kind of instruction of how to tuck a drum head. Cool. Um, and I don't remember what year that was, but but it's out there in Drum Magazine. And um, so that's just kind of an acquired skill that that you get. I mean, it takes a while to, you know, 
get a hang of it. The guy, my manager was doing it before to do them really quickly. I'm a little slower. Um, but you know, it gets done and you know, I know how to get it done. It looks nice. Um, yeah. And then, then, you know, then we put it on and dry it and set the depth so that it's consistent between the top of the counter hoop and the top of the drum head. So we have it in, it takes a couple days for it to dry. And, um, you know, then we take it off and then bag it and, uh, seal it, you yeah. know, to avoid the effects of moisture while it's sitting around. And, um, you know, then it's ready to go. Wow. Yeah. So I pretty quickly, uh, just Googling it I, and I'll, I'll include it in the show notes per usual. Um, I found this and it's pretty awesome. I mean, man, and that is, there's a lot of little tools that you're using in this, in this, like you said, it's like a 22 step pictorial uh guide yeah. and i mean boy it is just it's just so interesting and it the head looks in this particular picture that again you know go to the show notes and you can see it it looks really thin i guess that's a bottom head maybe that i'm looking at which is probably thinner but that's a batter head that's a probably a concert uh snare drum head he was talking i there's one thing that i've added to the to make it a little bit easier for me i'll actually um when I do the tucking, I'll fold the, you know, the edge of the calf over the hoop and use the clothespins hmm. and lock those, lock the fold in with clothespins and then do the tucking, remove the clothespin and then put the clothespin back on and, and go around and do the tucking that way. Same way he does it. Yeah. But it just, it just keeps it centered easier and you can push a little harder to push the calf through uh, and you don't have to worry about, you know stressing one side from the other because the clothespin kind of helps and holds things. Sure. So that's just something I've done to make it a little easier for me. He, he had, my guy had been done it, had learned from Polanski's guys and had, he'd been doing it for, you know, he worked for me for 20 some years. So he was doing it you know, from the get go. But so I've been doing it the last, you know, three years now. So you've got this drum head that you have been, you know, about that you're starting the process of tucking, you've gotten it nice and uh, hydrated and you obviously, so it says here you use a squeegee to remove the excess water. But so as you're doing the process, it's a little bit damp, I guess, but as the moisture is leaving the drum head, cause it's skin, then it's tightening itself a little bit and, and locking in your tucking, right? Well, during the tucking process, it's pretty quick, so the yeah. skin's plenty wet. You don't have to worry about that. Now, if you're tucking a, a translucent calf head, like let's say a, a, a snare side, the res side for a snare, that's very thin and they're very delicate, so we only soak those for, you know, five minutes. So they don't hold the moisture as much. So when I'm tucking, I may have to do the, the res side. I may have a little dish of water there that I can sprinkle on at each, you know, one, that I can add to, add some moisture to the tuck as I'm going around it because that will, that head will end up getting a little stickier mm -hmm. and drier and hard to tuck. So a little bit of water makes a little, adding a little water to the edge makes it a little easier. Got it. And then as it dries, when it, when you're done and you obviously want it to dry, then it, it, which leads into my next question here is it, so it's going to then tighten itself as skin does uh, I guess when it's, you know, when it loses that moisture, it's going to start to tighten up. Um, right. I mean, it's 2021, but like skin doesn't care if it's a hundred years ago or if it's today, it's the same problems that you would run into. Obviously we have more temperature controlled venues where maybe if you're playing a gig, you're going to be more in an air conditioning and you're not, play it doesn't matter as much if it's raining outside, but people still with these heads have to deal with uh, humidity issues and loosening and tightening, correct? Yeah, nothing's changed from that. I mean, I remember being at one of the pace conventions and watching, you know, uh, a band and the drummer playing a drum kit was, had a spray bottle next to him. And I'd uh -huh. see him spraying in an air-conditioned lobby of a hotel, and I'd see him spraying the, you know, give it a little moisture the, to his bass drum. Hmm. The, 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 the things you have to worry about are the um, the real thin heads, they're, you know, they're going to react a little bit stronger and tighten more. So you, you, the things that the, the biggest risk is playing in a, in a humid conditions and really, so you're cranking it up and then putting it in an air conditioned room without 
be tuning at before you do that. That's the type of thing where, you know, but people learn how they have to deal with it, you know, if they're gigging with it or. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, these, like you said, this is, you're, you're, you're usually pretty experienced and this is specialized, um, to some degree. Uh, I know the head that I have that's on this, um, old bass drum that I, I bought this bass drum at like a antique, like a flea market kind of thing, an outdoor thing. It was $35. And, um, I'm pretty sure I've talked about it on the show before, but I, I, I saved it from being bought by an interior decorator uh, <laughs> who was going to like put it, you know, I'm sure there's the old joke of like, put a piece of glass on it. Boom. You got a table <laughs> with yep. anything, right? right. <laughs> like anything yeah. and everything. I, I, is sure. A table. We talk heads for that purpose. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but I have it and it's like it just in the middle of the uh, I don't know. I actually don't know if it's batter or, or you know, the um, rezo head, but it is split. It's from being so old and I'm sure it's just in, in, in someone's attic and it's just been hot and cold and hot and cold and it just split. Right. Um, am I mistaken? I think I saw somewhere online that you can actually repair a split head. Is that right? I, I don't know if you can. I mean, we'll sometimes I'll, you know, uh, I was told that people will take, if it's a tiny little split, you know, that's one thing, a big split, you're not going to be able to. Yeah. It's like really exploded. Fix. <laughs> right. So um, a, a tiny split, uh, people will sometimes use barge cement and, mm. um, you know, a little patch of vellum and then glue it and glue it to the flesh side. Okay. To try yeah. to cover that. Now, if it's a split along the bearing edge, that's tough. That I don't know, Then you're done. Yeah, because that's where the tension is. Right. This episode is brought to you by Dream Symbols. Dream Symbols is launching the Tasting Tour 2021. There's going to be tons of cool symbols, members of the Dream Team on site, and the recycling program will be in effect all day at these various awesome music stores around the country. September 4th, they'll be at Everything Musical in Columbus, Georgia. September 11th and 12th, they'll be at Epic Percussion in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. October 2nd, they'll be at Forks Drum Closet in Nashville. October 9th, Melody Music in Bloomington, Indiana. October 16th, Rhythm Traders at Portland, Oregon. And November 6th, they'll be at Rupp Strums in Denver, Colorado. So go out and check it out if Dream will be in your town. So the big boys, the Remos and the Evans and all these things, they don't even go near this um, because I guess it's so time intensive. Um, But, you know, I'm, I'm sure they do make those heads that sort of recreate the feel of a calfskin head. Um, I know I'm sure you're not really out there playing them too often, but have you heard anything about, I'm assuming it doesn't really come close to the real thing. Yeah, I, I hear, and I've asked because I'm not a drummer. So, you know, at the beginning I was like, well, I don't know if I can hear the difference. When I hear it now, I can, I can, I can hear the difference between the plastic and the, and the calf. Yeah. But, you know, others have told me, you know, there's a, percussionist at the Royal Opera House in London who said, I said, you know, why do you, why do you, I asked him when I was visiting, why do you like half? Because it, feel, it just feels better to play on it. Hmm. It's easier on my hands, you know. And then, so, I, you know, I didn't think of that when I was first starting this business, that it, it feels better. Uh, most of the guys that just say they can't, they just, the, the mylar just doesn't replicate the sound that you can get out of calf. Yeah. And you can do things with, you know, people tell me you can do things with castle cap. So, for instance, on a bass drum, I've had guys tell me that they they like it super low, play it where it's like squishy, soft, and loose. Hmm. And in a mylar head, you, you know, it's either you got to tune it up or it, it's nothing. Yeah. In calf, you can apparently you can do different things. So you can you can play it tighter, you can play it looser, you can get different sounds, and it works, you know, in different ways. Sure. Now. Uh, so you said being over in London and you talked about kind of, uh, you know, the, the fashion industry in Italy before is America. Um, I mean, I guess, I mean, obviously there's cows and goats all over the place, but are we slash you, um, are the, are we exporting skins and, and tanned, you know, hides a lot, or is this kind of, you know, people well, typically stick in their, their region that they order. No, from. I mean, in, in the States, there's very few tanneries left. So everything pretty much gets for fine leather might get exported to uh, Italy. Hmm. Like the kid, the, the kip calf skin that I buy, kip skins are large calf. Um, so I buy those 
And um, so I'm competing with the Italian tanneries. Most everything else here in the States is going to China for tanning. So the raw skins are, you know, salt cured and palletized and shipped overseas. So there's very little production of raw hides going on. There's a couple big tanneries that do cowhide leather here in the States. Um, but, you know, a lot of it is for the smaller hides, a lot of it, most of it goes overseas now. Mm, interesting. Okay. So uh, let's say. Um, if I'm a drummer who, uh, really wants to experiment and maybe get a snare head or get into this, I know you've said that it can be, I mean, they're going to find out if they want to order. So, so how much does it typically cost per head? And then maybe we talk about, do people do a top head and a bottom head? I mean, cause even with, with, you know, let's say you buy Remo drum heads and you do your top and bottom of every drum. I mean, you're probably looking you can spend with a bass drum head front and back, you can spend $300, $250 to do your whole drum set with, with Mylar, with synthetic drum heads. Uh, what is the price range typically on, on, uh, on your heads? So for instance, for drum kit, um, and what we sell the most of are probably 14s and 16s, a 14 inch calf on wood is $80 and a, like a 16 inch calf on wood is $95. Okay. Uh, and people do, people do both, uh, top and bottoms, most do just the tops, but, um, yeah, we sell and I'll make a, a, you know, depending on what the drummer wants, I'll make a thinner one for the res side. I mean, I've had some, you know, studios order super thin res side for their, for their, uh, kick drum on the res side. So it really varies, but, um, yeah, you could spend hundreds of dollars outfitting a, you know, a drum here. A yeah. Drum I mean, it sounds like if you, if you have a 1920s trap kit and you want to make this thing as period correct as humanly possible and you want calf everywhere, I mean, it sounds like you could spend like, you could get close to like a thousand dollars if there's, depending on the amount of drums that you have, uh, front, back, top, bottom, snares, Chinese, Tom, Tom, whatever. Um, so, it, it it's not something to take lightly, but if you want to have it period correct, and if you want to get into that world, it sounds like, um, but I think everyone understands from hearing you that this is not an easy process. This is a labor intensive process and you're paying right. for your, your talent right. and your, your background and your skills and all that. Yeah. And the other thing about calf is the heads last forever. I mean, okay. We have customers that have had, you know, I'll run into them at, basic and they say oh i bought that head from you 13 years ago i still love it and you know so i mean i get you know so this calf skin doesn't dimple right really? you just so you can keep using it yeah i mean when, when you buy a kick a calf skin for a kick i mean that's probably the last bass drum head you're going to buy for that drum man um so it, you know there is that i mean this stuff lasts forever so it, and that's why you still see drum heads you know i mean you see you know drums from the 40s calf heads still floating around from the original ones yeah but like you said you got to make sure that if you're um gonna store them or whatever you need to detune it obviously so it doesn't get tighter and then looser and tighter so so would you just detune it all the way to make this kind no of, uh, it's just we have an instruction sheet that we give to people but it's just detuning it a little bit you don't want to okay. do it so dramatically that you change the location of the bearing edge okay so you want to keep it in that range, but it's just maybe a quarter turn or something like that, or half turn. I or see. Cover, if you're in a really dry condition, you maybe you want to just put a, you know, a mylar head over the top of it, or you know, something mm. to protect it. But it's not as much as it's you know as much work as it you might think. But um, you do have to be cognizant of putting something in a really highly air conditioned area you know it's yeah it's going to change things i think sometimes um stories and legends and i don't want to i guess tall tales you kind of hear like again me hearing from like my grandpa it's like he made it sound like at some point to me that the head was just becoming so loose dr like during the, the the course of a gig that it's like you know hanging off it's like skin drooping and i'm like okay now you're talking it's like i guess it's not that dramatic <laughs> no I, I i'm sure if you know you're outside playing and it's and you're at seventy percent humidity or something, you're gonna have problems. I mean, I'm just you yeah. know, it's, the calf isn't for any everything, and that's why they they 
graded mylar, right? Sure. You know. That's exactly. And, and we won't uh, raise the question of who invented mylar because that <laughs> is a, a sticky subject for a lot of people. But um, all right. Now, uh, as we're getting close to the end here, I would be interested to talk a little bit more as much as you can. I know um, we've talked about it on some previous episodes a little bit about um, so tanning in the big picture, like many historical uh, technologies, has a much bigger background and applications than drumming so like medieval times i mean going back i'm sure tanning goes back as far as man um you know sure. and and when they figured it out uh the biggest priority was probably not a drum head it was probably creating clothing or anything like this so um i don't know i mean it's a pretty broad question but maybe we can just talk about as much as you can the history of this stuff a little bit and and i think it has a connotation of being historically very uh like a tannery would be very smelly and involve like uh i guess you could say like brains people say and like excrement from animals to use the chemicals and urine and all this stuff um so i don't know what you want to shine some some light on all that well yeah maybe you know many many years ago but things have changed now the tanneries are pretty modernized sure you know and we're i mean it's not like we're super modern but we have a you know, a wastewater treatment system. So we treat all of the wastewater that goes through the tannery has to be treated. Mm-hmm. Um, we recycle, you know, so we do chrome tanning and our other leathers that we make here and the sheepskin. And so we recycle and you reuse the chrome. So there's very little in, in all the water is treated for chrome. So there's like no chemicals going out into the, you know, so we're monitored and everything is really clean for the Milwaukee. So it's not like you envision, you know, the old days. It's, yeah. You know, chemicals, no one's, no big tanneries are using brain, doing brain tanning. All that kind of stuff is, you know, done in small operations. Um, so the, the tanneries now are pretty clean and the wastewater systems are pretty good and, you know, everything gets dried. The sludge gets tre- treated, sludge gets, you know, filtered and dried and, um, yeah, suitable for landfill. So it's, it's just not, I mean, there's definitely odors. You can't avoid it because of, sure. you're dealing with raw skins. Yeah, uh, and the chemicals can kick off some odor, odors too. Now, the chemicals that we use to unhair in a big operation, that chemical does smell like rotten eggs. It, <laughs> uh, it does stink, but <laughs> yeah. we use so little of it because we use such a mild um, unhairing process. You know, it's almost like using nothing. So you yeah. know, we don't really have that strong of an odor anymore with what we do. Gotcha. All right. So you said it, brain tanning. And, I, and I'm and i just, you know, pe- yeah, people like this stuff. We got to ask the gross question. What is it about, like, a animal's brain well, that so does that? Yeah, it's the, it's the acidity you get from it. So that's in, in tanning leather, um, you need acid to pickle and cure the hide. So the brain, the acids from the brain will act as the acid that you use hmm. you know so for instance if i don't use brain tan if i do tanning we use formic acid and sulfuric acid you know in barrels <laughs> so yeah, makes sense right but guys that are doing the traditional brain tan and and that's really labor intensive because they have to do things to then manually soften the leather because it doesn't provide as soft of a leather as like a more modern chrome tan or alum tan does yeah, but um, yeah, it's just you know, there's there there are people doing it, and it's a specialty, and there's still it's still a desired market. I mean, there's a lot of demand for that. It's just on a small scale, and and uh, there are guys that will are willing to do that kind of really hard physical work and do smaller volume, sure, and uh, and make it. Well, I just always find it fascinating that like, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm referring to like medieval times, but um, and I think most people who are kind of into the history stuff know that like. Yeah, brains would obviously be one thing, but like the amount of things that people would use like urine for um, to make like gunpowder and use it as like cleaning agents. And I remember hearing that people would use it to like clean their teeth uh, in the olden days, which, you know, we obviously think it's disgusting and gross, but like you don't have these chemicals, <laughs> you know? Right. Well, Jeff, why don't we tell people here... Um, if they're interested in this, a lot of pe- listeners to the show, a lot of listeners of the show are very um, 
you know, diehard collectors and they're probably customers of yours already. I'm sure some of them, but, um, how do they go about ordering, um, you know, a calf skin or goat skin, uh, drum head from you? Yeah. So I, I've started, um, making an online store, which I've never finished. Um, cause I just haven't been able to have the time to make enough inventory to ever stock it. Yeah. So the best way to order from me now is still phone or email. You can find uh, us online at sterntanning.com, and you can email me through the the website. Uh, there's prices out there. I don't have an order form, so it's pretty much you get a hold of me. I'll you know we can do PayPal or credit card, and and uh, so it's still a little uh, old fashioned, but yeah, uh, yeah, it, it works. Um, and then you know I I'll ask questions. For instance, things they should know ahead of time is so. If, for instance, if it's an old kit. You know, let's say a, a 20s, 30s, or 40s kit. Those heads may need uh, oversized heads, where the hoops are just a touch larger than the modern ones now, because um, that's how they made it. You know, back in those times. Yeah. So, like an old Gretsch kit may need an oversized hoop. We can do that, but I need to know. So, the questions I may ask are if whether or not a standard Mylar head fits uh, your drum, or do you need to get something a little bit bigger? Is it too tight? Um, and then I'll know that so I can size the hoop a little bit larger when I, when I set it up and glue it. Um, thicknesses of what you like, you know, um, for instance, you know, or the type of playing, if you're just a light jazz guy, do you want it? So then maybe you want a little thinner. Um, uh, someone who plays heavier, you know, we may, may go up to like a 14 thousandths in thickness, um, for a batter head. So it's those kind of questions and, and, um, and usually, uh, so every time someone calls or emails me, I kind of go through that routine of asking that question, those questions. Yeah. Um, and then we figure out what they want. Yeah. You, you bring up a very good point. And I believe we talked about it on the, uh, uh, a premiere episode with Mike Ellis, uh, premiere drums. They, there's pre international sizes where they, if you're buying a vintage kit, I think, you kind of just raised a flag where, you know, if you own a 1920s drum set, you probably know this, but make sure you measure because they might be half inch sizes. They might be, you know, five eighths of an inch, nine and five eighths of an inch uh, instead of 10 inch or uh, 12 inches is 11 and seven eighths. And I'm reading a not so modern drummer kind of blurb about it real quick just to kind of uh, refresh my memory. But so, you know, don't take for granted that you have a, 12 inch Tom and a 16 inch floor and a 20 inch kick. They're slightly different. So, um, as Jeff was just saying, make sure you, you know, talk to them beforehand and kind of figure that out. Uh, cause they, they didn't make it easy at first. Yeah. And as far as I understand too, some of that was, so back in the day, you have to order your Gretsch drum head for your Gretsch drums from a Gretsch dealer or from a Gretsch themselves or whoever, who makes that particular, 24 and a half inch bass drum head um to kind of keep it all in their uh you know keep it all in their side of buying things yeah and we've had people uh we have a lot of people that send us drums because they have odd sizes i you know i can't i need the drum to make if i'm going to make a wood flesh hoop i need the drum and hardware and everything to to make the drum head uh, I need it for sizing and I also need it to dry it because I just, you know, sometimes people want to send me uh, a flesh hoop um, that's an odd size. And one of the difficulties is, is I can't dry it then because mm-hmm. when, a, when a drum head dries, when it's not on a drum frame, it'll warp and potato chip from the day, drying process. Interesting. So, I mean, there are times when I've done things where I've actually taken the tucked head dried the outer edge, sealed it in a plastic bag, and then overnight it to someone. And then they've got to be available to put take it out of the bag right away because you don't want it to mold, of course. Yeah. And then put it on their drum and dry it. So mm. I've had situations where we've done that. More often than not, if it's, if it's a smaller base to any size tom, smaller tom, uh, they'll actually just send me the drum. And then, you know, we can make a complete thing there and send it back. Wow. So we do that also. And, um, yeah, that's, great. I, that's the that that's the difficult part in the odd size shape. We had Mr. Polanski had more of those sizes, like a twenty five and a half, and different 
you know, variables. And I, I lost my factory burned down in 2007. Oh God. And so a lot of the, the drum frames that I bought from Mr. Polanski, I, I lost all those in the fire. Wow. So when we started up again, I had to, you know, I was on, I was on eBay. People thought we were probably wondering how, why they're selling so many drum frames. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I wasn't buying anything nice. Yeah. I was just buying, you know, everything I could find that were 14 inch snare drums that were affordable for me. Yeah. When I started back up and other, you know, every size I could think of. I mean, all the way up to 40 inch concert bass drum I bought, and, you know, so I had to restock all of those sizes after the fire. But I, what I wasn't able to do was restock the odd sizes that Polanski had collected over the years. The 25 and a, 25 and a half was a real common, 27 and a half was a real common. Um, yeah, bass drum and, very and rare. Those, I'm, I'm sure to find that that equipment that he used that those sizes. I mean, that had to be. I'm sure they're just not around anymore. Right. I mean, you, you, once in a while you can maybe find one, but it's not like I sell a lot of those, so I'm not going to spend you know thousands of dollars to get a 27 and a half inch bass drum. But those are the things that that happen. That so now it's made things a little bit tougher. So if someone has an odd size, it's the safest thing to do is to send me the drum. Hmm. Makes sense. And I mean, uh, Mr. Polanski was obviously doing this in 1951. So for him, it would have just been, you know, oh, that's the way it is. There's a 27 and a half. There's a 25 and a half. This is stock, you know, standard sizes. But uh, that is clearly not the the case anymore. Um, so awesome. Right. Well, Jeff, I mean, I want to thank you for being on the show. I want to thank Bill Ryder uh, for getting us uh, getting me your info back in November of 2020 which um you know that was right in the thick of it so um thanks for taking the time jeff i think this is awesome you've done a i mean again you've you, you've held your own amongst uh, drummers to be able to teach us all something that we do not know about and uh hopefully you can get some customers out of it um and uh yeah thank you for being here all right well thanks for having me bart If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.